El Salvador is one of the most dangerous countries in the world to live in today. In recent years, its homicide rate has gone through the roof, making it the deadliest country in the world outside of an active war zone. But how did the country get to this point? Hey guys, I'm Versha, and today we wanted to go deep into the history of how El Salvador became such a dangerous place. First, to understand what's going on there today, let's go back to the 19th century. El Salvador has struggled with extreme inequality between the ruling classes and everyday citizens for a really long time. But what was the source of this problem? Some say it was coffee. Coffee became a major cash crop for El Salvador in the late 1800s. It led to what some call a coffee revolution, which brought in a new stream of cash into the country. But here's the problem. Two major families controlled most of that wealth and used it to become politically powerful. This kind of pattern would go on throughout the 1900s, leading to the formation of the Central American Socialist Party and an uprising against the government. But in 1932, the government brutally cracked down on this peasant uprising, killing anywhere from 10,000 to 40,000 people. Remember this, because it's going to come in handy later. A man named Firabundo Martin was the leader in this peasant uprising. The massacre later became known as La Matanza, and it really established the government's military power. While all of this was happening, El Salvador was also in a land tug of war with its neighbor, Honduras. Honduras is more than five times the size of El Salvador, but the population of El Salvador was bigger. So Salvadorans began relocating to places like Honduras. Honduras responded by passing land reform laws that essentially took land away from Salvadoran immigrants and gave it to native-born Hondurans. They also expelled many migrant workers. As if that weren't enough, tensions continued to rise when these two countries faced off in the 1969 FIFA World Cup qualifier. After the games, violence broke out between fans of the two countries. This ultimately led to an intense four-day war in July 1969 that became known as the quote, football war. The brief conflict ended in a ceasefire, but it still had a lasting impact on El Salvador. During this period, the military grew even stronger. Then, in the 1970s, an oil crisis and even more economic instability shook the region, causing communism to become more popular among the public. Then along came General Carlos Humberto Romero, who represented the Salvadoran military and the closely associated National Conciliation Party, a group that was strongly opposed to communism. When Romero won the presidency in a controversial election in 1977, it led to mass protests against him that were met with violence by the military and state-supported actors. Thousands of people were killed by security forces during this period. That instability went on for two years until 1979, when the revolutionary government junta deposed President Romero in a military coup. This was the beginning of the Salvadoran Civil War. The junta quickly formed a military dictatorship, killing peaceful demonstrators, assassinating leaders who were trying to form socialist cooperatives among the poor people in the country, and even killing Archbishop Oscar Romero, who dared to speak out against them. Here's where the U.S. comes in. We're now at the height of the Cold War, and the U.S. is worried about losing Central America to communism. So President Jimmy Carter actually supported this brutal new military government for the purpose of trying to keep the country stable. Carter provided some aid, but Ronald Reagan would come along and provide even more, nearly $1 billion in economic aid to the Salvadoran government in the coming years. In 1980, several left-wing communist and guerrilla organizations came together to form the Farabundo Martin National Liberation Front, named after the peasant leader that we told you about earlier. The group came to be known as the FMLN, and they became the main resistance against the unpopular dictatorship. And they fought fire with fire, launching military offenses against the government, using violence to try and take parts of the country back, and at times, they were often successful. But the Civil War would rage on all through the 1980s with the U.S. providing support to the dictatorship of El Salvador. About 80,000 people died during this war, and more than one million people were displaced. A peace deal was finally reached in 1992, after 12 years of war. A civil war that brutal obviously has lasting effects on a country, even today. But one aspect in particular is directly linked to the violence that we see in El Salvador now. 
Many people fled during the Civil War, and some of them ended up in Los Angeles, California. When in LA, they encountered gangs. So some of the children of these immigrants decided to form their own, and thus was born the infamous MS-13 gang. MS-13 quickly gained a reputation for extreme violence, drug trafficking, extortion, and more. They started in LA, but spread to other parts of the United States, and in the 90s and 2000s, spread down to Central America, partially because of US deportations. So a gang formed in LA, born of immigrants who fled El Salvador's civil war, have brought back brutal violence to the country in a vicious cycle. But that's not the only reason El Salvador is dangerous today. The drug war that has raged on in Mexico has also spread through Central America, and the lack of political stability has bred corruption. So this tiny country has been dealing with a potent cocktail of corruption, drug war, gangs, and the effects of a long civil war. As if that weren't enough, in 2001, the country was devastated by earthquakes that killed hundreds, causing landslides and mass destruction. The humanitarian disasters that followed were so bad that the George W. Bush administration offered temporary protected status to all Salvadorans living in the United States, which President Trump recently announced he was ending. But while parts of the country may have recovered from the property damage caused by the earthquakes, El Salvador very much remains a dangerous place to live. As we saw in this video, U.S. foreign policy can have lasting ramifications for other countries around the world. But what's the current U.S. foreign policy? Check out this video to the right that breaks down the Trump administration's first year of foreign policy. Thanks for watching Now This World, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos every week.